My eyes are about to take to the air while the rest of me stays firmly on the ground. I'm very nervous. Makes two of us. <laughs> We're joining a legendary engineer inspired by nature. That bird looked like it was having fun. A quarter century after he built the first human-powered plane, Paul McCready's creations are still revolutionary and are themselves inspiring a new generation of flying machines, including a plane that may one day fly on Mars. I'm Alan Alt. Join me as Scientific American Frontiers enjoys the pleasures of flying free. Brought to you by... Agilent Technologies. A's, C's, G's, and T's. Hidden in all this genetic code is the genetic cause of disease. With technologies from Agilent, scientists can now start turning code into cures. This program is also made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We're here to do some bird watching. Once we spot the bird. It's hanging underneath the fuselage. It's black. You'll see, see it that. when it gets airborne. Oh, I see it, yeah. The bird is actually a glider built by this man, Bob Hoy. Watching with me is Paul McCready, who's been encouraging Bob Birds in his quest to design a glider that can soar as well as a real bird. To McCready's delight, Bob seems to have done it. That's a real bird. It <laughs> really does look real, right? Paul McCready has been watching birds for most of his 75 years. Much of the next hour will be kept in his company as we explore some of the extraordinary accomplishments of a man whose childhood passion for all things that fly has never left him. Paul, why do you do this? What do you learn from this? Well, first of all, I think everybody is interested in birds. Uh, uh, when you're four years old and 10 years old and 12 years old, you like the, to watch birds, wish you could be up there with them. Look, look how close he is, look at it. In those boyhood days, the closest Paul could come to being up there with the birds was by building model airplanes. His father encouraged him, but never instructed him. Paul experimented with planes of all kinds, setting records and winning prizes. Meanwhile, his fascination with birds expanded to include other flying creatures. Nature has shown the great value of flight. For instance, if you're a mouse crawling around through the woods at night, you maybe can cover a quarter of an acre and you're crawling up and down through the muck and swamp and risking your life with snakes and scorpions and so on, whereas a mouse with, mouse with wings, the same size, called a bat, can cover maybe uh, 2,000 square miles that same night, safely up above all the ground, and uh, makes flight seem pretty appealing. So kind of shows us that we humans, who are docilely walking around on two-dimensional flat ground all the time, might do a lot more going up in the air and get some of those benefits that birds get. McCready himself joined the birds as a young man when he became an avid and highly competitive sailplane pilot. He was U.S. national soaring champion three times, and in 1956 he became the first American to win the international soaring championship. Today he's invited us to watch Bob Hoy's bird glider with him because it so perfectly captures the philosophy that has guided McCready for the last half century. Humans are part of nature, and we can learn an awful lot about our technological flying devices by looking at nature first as a role model and then as something to show how to solve some of the big problems. The problem Bob Hoy set out to solve was how to get his glider to turn. The thing that's different about uh, 
<clears throat> these ailerons and the normal ailerons is that they're Watching sitting. real soaring birds, he suspected they somehow employ the feathers on the tips of their wings. We've learned if we put those things down like that, we will get a, uh, uh, a little bit of forward thrust out of these feathers, actually. What does that enable the bird to do? It enables him to turn. See, we put one of them up and one of them down. They're, uh, then, then we get, uh, just gets, like an aileron. When he gets lift on this wing, he also gets a little thrust. The thrust pushes the wing forward so that the bird can turn as it banks, with little or no help from the bird's tail. This works, and it took nature 200 million years to do it. It took Bob about two years. About a year. <laughs> One year, yeah. Inspiration from nature, insight from theory, and lots and lots of experimentation to make something fly that's unlike anything that's ever flown before. That's the McCready Credo. Oh, and one more thing. That bird like it looked like it was having fun. For Paul McCready, the fun really began in the mid-1970s. A British businessman, Henry Kramer, was offering a large cash prize to the builder of the first successful human-powered airplane. And McCready had just taken on a $100,000 debt for a friend. I had no interest in human-powered flight, but I uh, had heard of the Kramer Prize. I knew it was 50,000 pounds. And when I noticed in a newspaper that at that moment a pound was exactly $2, suddenly this light glowed. Why, that's the amount of my debt, how exciting human-powered airplanes are. And so, and, and seriously, if I hadn't had that debt, there wouldn't have been a Gossamer Condor project. And I, you know, when I give talks, I tell people uh, I strongly recommend they acquire $100,000 debt to get motivated, <laughs> and they say many of them have. The debt may have been the motive, but it was McCready's love of watching birds that put the Kramer Prize within his grasp. He was on a vacation trip with his three young sons. We began really studying different kinds of birds because it turns out if you time how long it takes to do a circle and you estimate the bank angle, you can immediately calculate with a simple formula how fast the bird is flying and the size of the turning radius. And how does that compare with a hang glider? How does it compare to the sailplane? It provided some insight about the scaling laws that suddenly made you realize that the human-powered airplane that I was trying to think about became feasible. And if you just simply take a, a hang glider and make it three times big wingspan, but keep the weight the same, it cuts the power down to one third. And that's down to what a human can put out. And suddenly, that was the idea for the Gossamer Condor, which wouldn't have arisen if these birds hadn't been circling around and us making measurements. Did you know when you started watching the birds and measuring their circles that that was going to lead to a human-powered plane? No, it was just a fun thing to do to keep the kids quiet on a vacation trip. They kept in, uh, reciting Monty Python skits state after state until you're going out of your mind. And then you started, let's, uh, let's, let's measure birds now. <laughs> Large and light was the lesson from the birds. Paul also realized he could even sacrifice strength for lightness, knowing that the plane's low speed and altitude meant that even a crash would be relatively harmless. Then in September 1977, just two years after being inspired by the circling birds, Paul McCready and his Gossamer Condor won the Kramer Prize. His debt was paid off, and a new kind of flying was born. Dawn in California's Mojave Desert. Almost 20 years after the Gossamer Condor flew into history, its direct descendant is being rolled out for another historic flight. The Pathfinder is a flying wing powered by the sun. Built by Paul McCready's company, Aerovironment, the Pathfinder has been prepared for this moment by project manager Bob Curtin. It's very long. How, how long is this wing? That's a 100-foot wingspan. 100 feet, and it's all wing. Huh? That's right, all wing. There's no surfaces in the back like a normal airplane. Why did you make it all wing? Well, it's the optimum shape for something that you need to 
to make very light and collect a lot of solar energy, it happens to be a wing. Every inch of the wing is covered with wafer-thin solar cells. Even so, there's not exactly power to spare. How much energy are these solar cells collecting? They, they all collect at noon about 6,000 watts, which is about four hair dryers worth of energy. Come on, now yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute. You fly this 100 foot long wing with the energy that it takes to run four hair dryers. Exactly, four hair dryers. There's also a small reserve of battery power. Is that how you keep it closed when it's in flight? Or you have well, a, there will be more tape. There's, there will be tape strips <laughs> more all More tape, well, that's yes, good. That's, that's right, more tape. <laughs> but you're right, I mean, there's a lot of tape on this airplane. <laughs> this is the battery? This is the battery pack. It's, it weighs about 40 pounds, and it'll power the airplane for about three or four hours. Like the Gossamer Condor, the wing owes a debt to McCready's model building youth. You look through this transparent material here, it's almost like looking at a model airplane. I mean, That's there's right. this little stretch, like something like what I used to carve out of balsa wood when I was uh -huh. a kid. It's very similar to a model airplane. The ribs that form the wing shape that are made out of uh, styrofoam, they're made out of balsa wood in model airplanes, but very similar. Hollow Kevlar propellers are driven by high tech electric motors. Each streamlined cone weighs less than one ounce. The entire plane with six motors, the battery pack, and 60 pounds of solar cells weighs under 500 pounds. The wing is so large and so light that even taking it out of its hangar is a tricky operation. The team has to keep a constant eye on the wind. The fear is that a sudden gust could snatch the wing into the air. We have a, a bit of a tailwind right now, so I think we should rotate the airplane around uh, about 180 degrees. Up until this day in 1995, the Pathfinder had so far flown only at 1,000 feet or so. Keep going. Now the team is preparing for the first high altitude flight. Number one. The motors are now running on the sunlight falling on the wing. Yet it's so light, the engineers have to hold it back. It'll take off either from the blowing wind or the movement of the plane at just 19 miles an hour. Using the sun to power a plane is the sort of outrageous idea that once only a mind like Paul McCready's could take seriously. But his first such plane, a hybrid running on both human and solar power, successfully crossed the English Channel in the early 1980s. It was a typical McCready stunt. But by September of 1995, the potential of a solar-powered plane had become so great that NASA was paying the bills as the wing was being prepared for its first high-altitude flight. We're going to try to fly the airplane as high as it can, as high as it can fly, basically. And uh, as long as weather holds. Right now, the weather isn't looking very good. On this day, the winds became dangerously high for the fragile plane. For several days, the team rolled the wing out to the lake bed at dawn. So the wind is blowing at about seven miles an hour. We're at our limit. Uh, we don't want it to get much higher than this. And then they rolled it back to the hangar to wait for the next morning. Finally, with winds no more than five miles an hour, the first high altitude flight was ready for launch. Of course, the wing had no pilot, so it was to be flown remotely from the ground. Takeoff was handled from a nearby chase van. Everybody ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. You want me to call out this? This is Volvo Pilot. Uh, looks good. Go for throttle up. Four and five on. I'll just call out if something looks amiss. At full power in the morning sun, the wing accelerated across the lake bed. The 19 mile an hour liftoff speed was reached within seconds. 10 feet. S speed's 27. Speed hold on at 27. 
30 feet per second. Maybe around 600 feet, five, 600 feet right now. It was a good climb out. As the wing gently spiraled up from the desert floor, it was followed with cameras more used to observing the space shuttle. 20, 12 now, down here. And that's appropriate because McCready's idea is that solar wings circling at high altitude can replace many space satellites. I wonder if we'll ever see it again. I hope so. <laughs> On this flight, the crew's aim was to see how high they could push the Pathfinder. We're at uh, 33,000 feet. Things are going well. No serious problems right now. In fact, we don't have any problems right now. They worked from a control room in an old army truck. Now select waypoint 98. OK. Waypoint 98. Uh, we are heading toward a high wind area at 40,000 feet. Now came a big hurdle. The wing had never before flown through the strong winds of the jet stream. But the onboard camera showed the flexible structure riding the turbulence beautifully. By late afternoon, it was clear that because of greater than expected winds, they wouldn't make their 65,000 feet goal. But it was still a flight that broke the altitude record for solar powered planes by an enormous 40,000 feet. The sun is going down now. We still have a climb rate, so we're climbing. But at some point, the sun's going to get low enough that our climb rate goes to zero. And, and when the climb rate goes to zero, we'll be at our maximum altitude. There it is, 50000. This is an extraordinary flight. Now we just got to get it home. They switched to the onboard batteries to bring the plane back in the darkness. Two hours after sunset, and the Pathfinder arrives home. 300 feet. This 1995 flight showed that a plane powered by the sun could fly high above even the largest and most powerful commercial jetliners. Beautiful. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. But it was only the first step toward Paul McCready's vision of what his solar wing could become. Five years later, in the fall of 2000, the wing had more than doubled in length to almost 250 feet, while the number of motors had gone from 6 to 14. Now called Helios, the giant flying wing was undergoing low-altitude tests for what is intended to be a flight to 100,000 feet, almost 19 miles high, in the late spring of 2001. This would fly way above other aircraft, I mean, nobody's going to bump into it because they're all below it. Is, do I have that right? That's pretty much right. This one uh, is slated to do just a demonstration stunt uh, uh, to see if we can do it. A challenge to get to 100,000 feet where there's only about 1% as much air density as there is on the ground. But mostly it's aimed at flying at around 65,000 uh -huh. feet because the wind is light enough there so uh, it can stay in one place. And here we come to the reason why the solar-powered wing is much more than a stunt. Circling like McCready's favorite birds high above a city, a flying wing could be an alternative to space satellites for relaying voice or television or internet signals. Aerovironment's plan is for Helios to circle silently on solar power for as long as six months. Then one wing would descend as another flies up to take its place. You would bring it down every six months to make sure that it's in tip-top shape. Yeah, and I'm reason? sure you'd have to replace something, something yeah, you'd put refurbish some it. Part but in. also, every six months, you probably have better uh, communication gear to put in it. One of the bad features of satellites, you put them up with today's technology, and to get them to be economically viable, you have to keep it up, say, for 10 years. In 10 years, uh, the last five of those years, your technology is old-fashioned. Oh, I see. So here, you got a chance to redo it every yeah. six months. 
Since last fall, aerovironment engineers have been laboriously testing and applying to the giant wing sections the solar cells that will power the Helios. Since the solar panels will provide power only during daylight hours, the team is also working on a system of fuel cells, a kind of lightweight and highly efficient battery to store daytime electricity and keep the wing flying during the night. In the low altitude flight tests last fall, the Helios was still powered by conventional batteries. But the plane performed flawlessly, experimenting with using its motors to turn and even to pitch up and down. If the method works, the control systems for the wing could be greatly simplified. Another spectacular example of the McCready Credo of more for less. Now what have they got in those cases? Well, that's a small surveillance airplane, kind of nine pound, nine foot collapsible that uh, we've been making for over 10 years now. They get pretty widely used for being a pair of roving eyeglasses wherever you want to see what's over the next hill. Paul McCready's fascination with flying began with model airplanes. And now he makes them for people who want the advantage of a bird's eye view. Called the pointer, the plane is a typically McCradian combination of high and low tech. This wing is held on only with rubber bands. Huh? Why do you do that? So it'll pop off. Yeah, right? it's a safety device. So if it uh, lands really hard, the wing will pop off and not cause any damage. The idea behind the pointer is that it can be taken anywhere and be launched and flown by people with only minimal training. How high is it now? Uh, I would imagine about 250 feet. And it's making a little more noise because it's climbing. When it's just cruising along, it can go over your head at 50 feet and nobody ever knows it because you're not looking up all the time. What is that structure down there that the plane is flying there? That was a movie set for Eddie Murphy's Coming of America, and it's the remains of it. So this is a this is a perfect use for the plane if we were paparazzi now. Correct, correct. And we wanted to spy on Eddie Murphy's house. Yeah, is we could we could look look in somebody's backyard, and they probably wouldn't even know we were there. You know, it's great to know that scientific progress is being made like this. <laughs> How's this for surreal? Gazing down from the Californian sky at the remains of Eddie Murphy's fictional African movie mansion. Okay, so there's, that's there's, it, isn't it? There it is there. Alan, maybe we didn't mention it, but you are going to do the flying on the next flight. All of it. And you're not afraid of that? No. But we are making it the last flight of the day. <laughs> Just you know, case. I have to warn you that I flew a jet in a simulator. Yeah. And I crashed it. I actually crashed the simulated jet when I was trying to land it. At least I shouldn't have that problem with the pointer, which goes into an automatic landing mode at the touch of a switch. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa. I, I thought you were going to hit me with that plane. <laughs> it looked like it was coming right at us. Yeah, it was. But that's. That's about the, we could even get closer if we wanted to. It's just I didn't want to hit the camera. <laughs> Believe me, it's the least of your worries. Um, we're going to go through a pre-flight check. Clear prop. Okay. I'm very nervous. Makes two of us. <laughs> so the only thing we probably have to worry about is we have a slight crosswind, and you'll yeah. probably have to give a little bit of um, left rudder. So we'll give it full throttle. Full throttle, all the way forward. All the way forward, hold it, all the way. Okay. Here we go. Okay, and you left and go up. Now, it would be nice to claim that my belly flop was a calculated test of the plane's durability. Wait, it's going down again. But the truth, of course, is that I need a little help. Let me see here. It doesn't seem to want to go left. You may have jarred something, but... 
It looks to be okay now. Looking down from above, it's easy to get lost. I can't tell where I am on the ground. Yeah, well, you're coming across right to left right now. Right over here at our left. Oh, yeah, so should I go left a little yes, more? Yes, yes, why don't you do that? It's like steering a bus. You kind of got to anticipate and then kind of let go. Okay, there's the structure. I'm going to go right a little bit. Right, so basically you're just steering it. And you notice I'm giving you very little input. You're just kind of flying it around. Yeah. Now all I have to do is land it. Right about now, let's do it now. Oh, it's fine. There you go. Well, see, I'm good at getting it on the ground. <laughs> In fact, I did that almost immediately. One of Pointer's biggest users is the U.S. military. It was employed in what are still classified missions during the Gulf War. And here it's beaming back aerial shots during an exercise at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Flown with an infrared camera, the plane can easily spot enemy troops at night. Recently, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency began funding the development of planes even smaller and stealthier than the Pointer. To Paul McCready, the challenge was irresistible. Only weighs a couple of ounces, has... Uh, Called the Black Widow, this tiny plane is no heavier than the birds it's trying to emulate. Nature still, with birds and insects, does it better than humans, but we're learning a lot from them, and we're getting closer all the time. Is this uh, some kind of tracking thing, or what's, is that just for fun? What is that? It's Black Widow. Oh, I see. That, that's the <laughs> insignia that they use, the nice. logo uh, that nature puts on Black Widow spiders. Throttle check, launcher set. Matt Keenan has nursed the Black Widow yes. through most of its development. Ready? Three, two, one, launch. But this morning, its onboard camera records one of its less impressive flights. Didn't throttle up quite right there. What went wrong there? Um, there was a sequencing problem, and... Uh, I'm not sure. Let me just go and check. How's it going? Large. Great. Can you get, is it ready to fly now? It's all ready. Two hours later, Matt figures he's fixed the problem. Charged, ready to go. OK. Incredibly, this six-inch wingspan airplane, weighing not much more than a slice of bread and looking like no airplane I've ever seen, carries an onboard video camera, three computers, an electric motor, and batteries to run it all. Excellent. Install it on the launcher. It's launched from a compressed air catapult. Cross your fingers. Okay. Three, two, one, launch. <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> batteries on board today limit the flight time to just a few minutes. But with the batteries it will use in the field, the plane can fly for over 20 minutes. There we are, there we are. It's so fast and <laughs> quiet that an enemy probably wouldn't even notice it, let alone be able to shoot it down. Now, can anybody hear it? Just barely. Just, if you really just listen, barely. Yeah. It sounds like a fly. And it's right overhead, so when it's a few hundred yards away, you literally cannot hear it. In combat, the tiny spy plane is disposable. It's mission done, it simply crashes. What you call a belly landing. But this developmental model will get to fly again. The little fins. Fins that came off. Right. This one. Yep. Is the propeller intact? Well, it was a little bit damaged. But those are disposable again. We just pull it off, put on another one. Did you ever think you'd see this flying like this? We never even dreamt such things could exist when we started on this uh, about three years ago. We didn't dream that it could end up so successful. And if we had imagined it and we could have leapt to the solution, we would have saved ourselves three years. We have to give Paul a lot of credit. I've been working on this for the last three years, but we used his inspiration and his uh, design ideas of evolving a design and trying things and just go out and try it and don't um, analyze the hell out of it. <laughs> and uh, that helped a lot because this is a very uh, unconventional design we ended up with. The 
pioneering is the exciting part, and somehow at AeroVironment we've accumulated just the most wonderful staff of inventive people. The problem is to keep everybody from being too inventive, or we wouldn't get any work done. You have to keep beating people down and say, no, focus on this project. But the people who are here are dynamite. What is this? Well, uh, AeroVironment's this inventiveness is, is now paying off in a plane whose mission is literally out of this world. This could fly on Mars. This could fly on Mars, that's right. And the atmosphere on Mars is a lot like it is here on Earth at 100,000 feet. Oh, so, your, so your planes are perfect for, our for Mars. Our experience is very good uh, for designing airplanes to fly on Mars. This airplane actually folds up, a lot like this little model right here. The wings fold, fuselage folds down over that, and the tail folds down over that mm -hmm. to fit inside a small probe, which is carried by a spacecraft all the way to Mars. When that probe enters the atmosphere, it'll open under a parachute. The airplane will unfold, release the parachute, and begin flying along canyon walls on Mars. Looking uncannily like a flight on Mars itself, this was actually a test of the plane flying in Red Rock Canyon in California's Mojave Desert. But within the next decade, the plane could be flying along the walls of the largest known canyon in the solar system, the 2,500-mile-long, six-mile-deep Valles Marineris on Mars, giving us a bird's-eye view of a place where, as far as we know, birds have never been. Pioneers of flying free were the insects. They first took to the air a third of a billion years ago. One of the world's great students of insect flight is George Rupel. Among his favorite subjects, dragonflies. Here we have uh, caught a large dragonfly, one of the best flyers we have. And dragonflies not only have powerful wings. Oh, it will bite me. Ow. We met George Rupel a few years ago in Germany, where this marsh is one of his favorite spots for stalking dragonflies. How do you look for them? Do you, do you, do you, just, you scan with your eyes? Or you... Yes, I scan with my eyes, and then I detect little blue, blue and black bodies. Like most scientists who study flying creatures, Rupel employs slow motion photography. But George shoots his movies on location, rather than in the laboratory. So what's the idea? Why come out to the... Um to the pond and shoot. Why don't you take the dragonflies into the laboratory where the conditions are, are controlled? Yes, controlled, uh, but uh, the dragonfly don't behave normally. They only show here in natural conditions their full behavior and even their full flight behavior. And therefore we have to go out. Please let us have, have, have a look. There is a dragonfly sitting on the stem. I can, I hope I can film it. What fascinates George Rupel about dragonflies is how they use their flying skills in their everyday life. For example, male and female dragonflies often fly in tandem pairs after they mate. The female has to dip her tail into the water to lay the eggs the male has fertilized. By riding shotgun like this, the male is keeping his rivals at bay. Here, one of those rivals switches from hovering flight to full forward thrust in an attempt to dislodge the first male from his mate. A third male briefly joins the dogfight, and in the confusion, the first male gets dumped. The attacker switches to high power backward flight as he pulls away with the female. The aerobatics continue as the new male flips the female into a somersault, apparently expelling the eggs the first male fertilized. Now the newcomer has a chance for fatherhood. Breaking free of both land and water some 350 million years ago, flying insects became the most successful life form on the planet. 
Flying insects make up 60% of all living species known to science, even if their flying skills sometimes fail them. But how insects came to fly is one of the great mysteries of evolution. Where did wings and all the complex muscles and nerves needed to operate them come from? As the woods and rivers of eastern Pennsylvania began waking up from their winter deep freeze, we joined biology professor Jim Martin and his student, Melissa Kramer, in a hunt for clues to the origins of insect flight. One of these clues lies beneath the water, where many insects begin life as swimming larvae, like this mayfly. Have you seen him before? No. Its gills beat in the water like miniature oars, and many biologists now see these flapping gills as the forerunners of flapping wings. But that still leaves the thorny question of just how oars became wings. If evolution proceeds in steps, with every step being useful for something, what use is something halfway between an oar and a wing? It's a question Jim Martin now believes he may have answered, thanks to his love of fly fishing. Well, in fly fishing, you're tying some feathers and string on a hook in order to imitate an insect. Uh, but that's only half the battle, because then you have to come out here in the stream and present it to the fish in the right way. And so fly fishing made me a real student of the behavior of insects on water. And it was while watching insects on water, especially a group of winged but flightless insects called stoneflies, that Jim Martin suddenly saw what good a half wing could be. Stoneflies often emerge from their larval form in the middle of a river, and they need to get to shore quickly in order to find a mate. Stoneflies are drab and uninteresting, even to most biologists, unless you're planning an experiment to find out if wings evolved first not to fly in the air, but to skim across the surface of the water. OK, let's see if we can get one. Back in the lab, the Pennsylvania State University biologists found their stoneflies to be highly cooperative, behaving in front of a high-speed video camera, yeah. just as they do in the river. OK. Here she is, and we've just dropped her in the water. She's struggling to get free of the surface tension. Here she's raising up and trying to get her tip of her abdomen pulled off the water there. The trick to this surface skimming is we found they have to really get up on top of the water. It doesn't work if any of them is touching the water except their tips of their legs. There, now she's ready and off she goes. And she's nice and stable and off screen flapping. You can still see her flapping in with her shadow there as she goes. This use of wings to propel an insect across the surface of water is what Jim Martin believes to be the missing link in the evolution of flight. Most of the experiments to test this hypothesis were run by Melissa Kramer. What I'm doing is videotaping these stoneflies surface skimming from above with a centimeter grin underneath so that I can get their velocity. I can measure the time that it takes them to run a certain distance by getting that off of the videotape. With the slow motion replay, Melissa can count the number of video frames it takes for the stonefly to skim a certain distance. The insects average about one and a half feet per second. Then she clips the insect's wings with a pair of nail scissors and measures the speed again. The insects are slower, but not by much. Now here's the critical test. When she clips the wings to mere nubs, less than a quarter of their original length, the stoneflies can still use them to skim around on the surface of the water. So even a nub of a wing, a wing much too short to allow flight, can be useful and completes an evolutionary pathway along which gills could have become oars, oars flapping sails, and flapping sails wings. Well, the Darwinian idea of evolution is a gradual, stepwise process. And so right from the time that Darwin first proposed his ideas, he was attacked on many fronts. One front was how do you get highly complex traits that only work in their full-blown and fully integrated form? What good is a nub of a wing is a direct quote from one of Darwin's contemporaries. So 
One of the things we're out here doing with these stoneflies is showing what nubs of wings really are used for. Most of the airplanes Paul McCready has made in his life owe little to insects, but not all. Is this going to flap its wings? It'll flap and fly beautifully. Unless I bust it while assembling it. How many hours did it take to, to build well, this? Well, a friend builds these, and he lets me have them if he, because he knows I'm going to show them to kids and to people who think like kids. <laughs> but I need somebody to wind. Let's see. 20 turns. It's flying a little too straight now. <laughs> so you might be able to get that to come back to you? Oh, it, it, oh one, once it's going right, it goes around in circles that are about only about eight feet in diameter. You can practically fly it in a phone booth. Do you ever expect that up? that a plane that will be used for something will fly this way by flapping? Or is this... The passengers this? in the 747 would really be irritated <laughs> if the wings went like that. But it's virtually identical to things that I was making in 1939, 1940. And if I hadn't been doing these things then as a hobby uh, that led to other things, there wouldn't have been a Gossamer Condor, the 247-foot airplane. So is it practical? Uh, as a device, no, it's just fun, but uh, as a catalyst for thinking and hands-on work and developments and invention, uh, it turned out to be hugely valuable. The ones I made were just about like this, but I also made some smaller ones that uh, had much more power and would make noise, like and you'd release one behind your teenage sister without her knowing and just sounded like a bat and terrified her and little boys like to do well, things like that. Well, that sounds useful. I mean, yeah, that, that <laughs> has its merits. <laughs> For Paul, flapping wings may once have been more entertaining than practical. I get another three or four over there. But as we'll see in a moment, there are plenty of missions beyond scaring a teenage sibling that a tiny flapping flyer could perhaps one day take on. Now we'll see if this gets a turn. Okay. Yeah, it's a little more like it. Of course, if a thermal comes, that's the last this will ever be seen. Of course, if it lands in the bush, it may be the last it's ever seen, too. It doesn't get hurt. No, no, it's OK. It's, it's pollinating the flowers. For some reason or other, Kids like this, CEOs of billion-dollar corporations like it, they all want one, and the fact that they can't have one mm -hmm. makes it more appealing to them. <laughs> one multi-billion-dollar organization that wants a tiny flapping flyer is the Defense Department. For soldiers fighting in house-to-house -house combat, a robot able to scout ahead and peer into rooms could be a lifesaver. Wheeled or tracked robots are already being developed that can carry cameras and other sensors into dangerous environments. But a small flying robot would be faster, more versatile, and harder to defeat. The same defense agency sponsoring the Black Widow we saw earlier is also supporting the development of indoor flyers, including one at Georgia Tech. If you're flying in close quarters, you've got to be able to fly slow. If we were to make the same vehicle with a fixed wing, it would have to fly very fast, and we'd have difficulty landing and taking off again. Uh, open rotors present a problem, because uh, if you touch anything, the rotor will little, literally explode. But a flapping wing is a very robust device. Uh, most people have seen a beetle or a bird that may have gotten into their home, and uh, even though they may bounce off the walls, they get up again, shake it off, and take off. This simple wind-up model has the twin flapping wings of the machine Rob Mickelson ultimately hopes to build. That's the kind of leading edge we should make. Yeah. But so. like others tackling the same problem, including this Professor Yu Chang Tai at Caltech in Pasadena, designers of flapping wing flyers face a difficult problem. 
Making a wind-up flapper, as Paul McCready proved almost 70 years ago, is child's play. But toys like this weigh almost nothing. And even the most miniaturized cameras, sensors, and computer controls, not to mention motors and power supplies, weigh something, even if no more than a key. So we may run into a dead end. That means more weight, you need, require more power. But in order to have more power, you have to put more weight. And there is a, a engineering boundary where we can, we can achieve. And that's where we are exploring. You have to design more efficient winds that will generate a lift to carry the weight. In their search for more efficient wings, the Caltech researchers have linked up with scientists at UCLA, hoping to learn the heavy lifting secrets of insects. This is a cicada wing that I'm about to mount. It's one of our larger uh, insect wings. It's also one of the stiffest wings we have. The UCLA researchers have been flapping a variety of insect wings in a wind tunnel. Strobe lighting and smoke reveal the way air flows around the wings. The idea is to see how insect wings generate lift and then try to replicate their key features in the lab. Actually making the wings involves the latest in high-tech manufacturing methods. In the sort of super clean environment usually used to make microchips, the wing design is photographically transferred to a thin sheet of titanium. The pattern is then placed in an acid bath to etch out the wing's metal skeleton. Finally, the skeleton is covered with a thin plastic film. So we've got the new when it came to making the wings fly, the Caltech UCLA engineers turned to the experience of Paul McCready's aerovironment team specifically to Matt Keenan, the builder of the Black Widow. That looks fabulous. Thank you. What's the uh, projected weight for these wings after they're uh, cut out? Perhaps about a few hundred milligrams. We joined the group one day in 1999, when the insect-inspired wing was undergoing flight tests. Well, why don't we just test flying this and see? And when it was quickly obvious that insects still know a thing or two that aeronautical engineers don't. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, launch. Yeah, it's trying. We really like to fly at the end of the project about one minute. And you should fly maybe a couple hundred meters away. So that's what we think we can do. But we still have uh, about one and a half years to go. And this is a very exciting project. We see it can fly now. Almost but not quite flying is another entry in the flapping wing derby built by a team at SRI International at Palo Alto. They too know that somehow they've got to find an extra source of lift. In order to achieve that extra lift, we've employed an um, aerodynamic uh, effect called clap fling, which is used by insects and birds of various sizes. In the slow motion effect produced by a strobe light, the wings can be seen folding together and peeling apart. As they come together, they're twisting. And then as they come together quite closely, they actually touch and they squish the air road uh, down, which, which helps in the, in the lift generation. And then as they come apart, they peel. And this, this effect is called clap fling or clap peel. And when they peel apart, you're creating a vacuum in here which forces the air to suck in between the wings. And that is very, very beneficial. You can get on the order of 1.5 to two times the lift. The wing's complex motion may be based on biology, but the gears and wheels and rods that produce the motion aren't. In nature, muscles both generate and deliver the power to fly, with no need for motors or transmissions. So several teams attempting to make micro flyers, including the SRI team, are trying to develop artificial muscles. Most work by contracting or expanding when an electric current is applied. These experimental artificial muscles are still too slow and weak to power a working flying machine. So these flappers are strictly for demonstration only, including a butterfly made entirely from artificial muscle. So far, it hasn't left its perch. Meanwhile, over at Paul McCready's aerovironment, 
Matt Keenan has replaced the insect-inspired wings that looked so promising 18 months ago in favor of wings that look uncannily like the ones his boss used to make 65 years ago. Three, two, one. It may seem unlikely that the McCready philosophy of testing and tweaking, testing and tweaking will ever produce a machine that can fly like a bird. That's what they said about a plane powered by a person. He's got it, he's got it, he's got it on his head. We're going to end our visit with Paul McCready's Flying Circus by meeting his son, Tyler, who with his two brothers helped build the Gossamer Condor 25 years ago. <laughs> I could chase it like this for hours. When they got bored with their father's project, they invented an extraordinary little plane of their own. And I can control it by putting the lift on one side of the wing or on the other. They called it their walk-along glider. I've never seen anything like that. How old were you when you invented that? Oh, 10, 11, oh my 12, God. something like That's that. amazing. <laughs> or or you got to teach me how to do it. I, I, well, let me see, see if I can do it. <laughs> so what you need to do is you need to um, be moving at a walking speed before you let go of it so that basically you don't, you don't throw it. Yeah. You just let go of it and it's already flying. Excuse me. The launch is the most difficult part. Well, it may be the part right after the launch, although Tyler is politely encouraging. You're getting it. Now, the, the second challenge, what you did there was get your hands behind it, uh -huh. which actually, it puts the lift near the trailing edge, and that makes it dive and makes the glider You want to get your hands you. under it, huh? Yeah, it's like a balancing act. To you keep to get your, your hands right under it? To keep your hands just in the right area so oh, that the lift is lifting Instead the wing. Of not, be, not, not behind, not back here. Yep, and this underneath. way, it keeps the air go going up into the wings. So yep. I want to get them like that. I see. I couldn't see yep. that that's what you were doing. But also, if they're too far forward, it'll stall and slow down. Got it. Got it. Okay. Woo. I had it for a few seconds. <laughs> that was great. Now the next challenge is to get it flying up in front of your face, and you can actually take your hands away. That thing with the head must be very hard to get. Did you, oh. see, did you see how it jumped as soon as your head got under there? When my head got under it, it really picked up. Young kids can pick this up pretty quick because it, it does involve a bit of balancing, and it, so you have to learn a skill for it. Um, but uh, you did a fantastic job. I was amazed, especially even getting it up over your head some. Well, I got just a, fra a couple of seconds. No, but, but, it, but it was impressive. It's you had the idea. to see you do it, to see you control it with your head. I mean, it's... It, 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 it almost looks magical. Mm -hmm. And the, the most amazing thing is that you figured this out when you were 10 years old. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's incredible. It's, well, there, there, yeah. There's all this brain power that, that, that other 10-year-olds must have we're not making use of. Uh, this is absolutely. great. Absolutely. All we did, we didn't actually, you know, set out to invent something. All we did was keep pushing the limits of what we were capable of doing. You played, which is, huh? which is very common with, yeah, any sort yeah, of child you were, you game. Were, you, you were just playing, and it looks like your mm -hmm. dad keeps playing no matter how old he gets. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, and pushing the limits of, yeah. of what his toys are capable of. Pushing the limits of what his toys are capable of. That's what Paul McCready has been doing with his toys for over 65 yeah, years now. I like it. And not just pushing the limits, often going far beyond the limits of conventional airplane design. Lighter, bigger, slower, higher, smaller, quieter. All the time inspired by his boyhood dream of flying with the birds. A dream that even at the age of 75 is still very much alive. I want to make a slow, silent airplane that I can fly around in. Uh, and look at scenery and have a good time. That's as quiet as my car inside and out, and having them fly with birds uh, would be a delight. It was in the still air of another early California morning that I came to say goodbye. What, you had, what are you working on? Well, playing with maybe is more the right word, though some of these silly things eventually result in something fairly important. And on this morning, uh, what Paul happened to be playing with 
was a model of the very plane in which someday he hopes to fly with the birds. Come visit us at PBS Online. Scientific American Frontiers can be found on the World Wide Web at pbs.org or America Online, keyword PBS. More and more people are putting on weight. On the next edition of Scientific American Frontiers, we'll be looking at America's obesity epidemic. Kids are getting fat. Everyone's on a diet. What's going on here? I'm Alan Alder. Join me next time as we ask, are we fat and happy? Brought to you by Agilent Technologies. The next generation of wireless communication is here. And technologies from Agilent are helping make it all possible. We've taken the fiction out of science fiction. This program is also made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Order this episode on video cassette or other programs from Scientific American Frontiers, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS. This is PBS.